Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. We killed ISIS leader Al Baghdadi. He's dead. He's dead as a doornail. <laughs> And he didn't die bravely either. I will tell you that. He should have been killed years ago. Another president should have gotten him. Welcome back. President Trump today touting the killing of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, but also blaming former President Obama for not killing the ISIS leader during his presidency. With me now is Nick Rasmussen, who was director of the National Counterterrorism Center during the Obama administration and was in the Situation Room during the mission that killed Osama bin Laden. He remained in that position for the first year of the Trump administration. He's now an NBC News national security and intelligence analyst. Nick, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, as somebody who was sitting in the Situation Room while Osama bin Laden was killed, what is your reaction to, to one, the president saying that uh, Obama should have gotten Baghdadi, and two, saying that Osama bin Laden was not that big of a deal until the World Trade Center happened? Well, I don't know quite how to react to that, Katie. Um, of course, getting Baghdadi was a priority for the Obama administration and working in a partnership with Iraqi security forces. And at a later stage, in cooperation with the, the Syrian Kurds, that's, take, that's taken us into the current phase of the fighting in Iraq and Syria. It was always a priority. But tracking down these terrorist leaders is a, is a meticulous, difficult, challenging bit of work. It takes time. Sometimes it takes a long time. And often it, it ends up um, happening rather quickly once you come across a key piece of intelligence. And that seems to have been what triggered... Um, the onset of this operation some months ago. So, so I, I wouldn't necessarily think of it as legitimate criticism that we weren't going after Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, because of, of course we were. Um, let, me, go ahead. let me ask you this other question. Uh, the president was um, uh, very forthcoming in describing how he said Baghdadi died. He said he didn't die a hero, he died a coward, he was crying, whimpering and screaming. And he brought three kids with him to his death. He knew the tunnel had no end. From your experience, the, the crying, the whimpering, the screaming, is that information the president would have been able uh, to obtain in watching this raid or in speaking to people afterwards? Well, I'm not exactly sure where he would have gotten that information, you know, based on the way he was probably monitoring the operation in the Situation Room. And I would actually rely much more on what you're hearing out of the Pentagon, either from sources at the podium. Uh, I understand the chairman of the Joint Chiefs today was, of course, speaking about the, the operation. Um, and, and in coming days, we'll hear more about it from the actual operators, uh, I would imagine. And so I would take much more what they say as being gospel here rather than something that the president is saying in a much more political vein. He's clearly, as one of your previous guests said, looking to revel in this. And so I think some of the details are probably being yeah. amplified. Well, is a nice way of putting it. In talking about how the uh, the leader died a coward and giving all that detail, uh, does that help us in the fight against ISIS? Does it hurt us in the fight against ISIS? How did those comments play? 
Again, in the end, I'm not sure it affects the ISIS audience one way or the other. This is an audience that isn't um, likely to be persuaded to back away from their ideology, to back away from what they are doing, trying to target Americans, trying to target Western nations. But it does, I think, um, put us in a in a less positive light with our partners in the region. Again, the, the idea that we're somehow bragging or um, talking boastfully about what is, in a sense, difficult, hard dirty work, uh, you know, targeting terrorists who are trying to kill us and, and eliminating them from the battlefield. It's not um, a simple business and it, it shouldn't be talked about in trivial ways. What about all the detail that he revealed uh, yesterday in that 47 minute presser? Well, again, I watched that, that presser and I was kind of wincing along the way as, as certain key details came out. I don't think there was any one detail that I would single out and say, you know, oh, wow, that that is a breach of security. But, you know, our, our special operations community, you know, treats its tactics very, um, very protectively, as they should. They have another mission tomorrow and the next day and, and the year after that and the week after that and the month after that. And so anything you do that talks about how they do their business, whether it's how many aircraft were involved or how they were flying or where they were coming from or how much time they spent on the compound. These are all details that don't need to be revealed, certainly don't need to be revealed in a way that might give our adversaries some kind of insight or advantage. Are we in a good position going forward to locate and eliminate or fight against terror terrorists, uh, stop it from happening? Um, now that the president has, or the president's been doing this for the past few years, been um, undermining our, our relationships with allies overseas. Are we still in a good position to fight the war against terror today with the way the president has treated our allies? Well, unfortunately, the, the, the effort to, to go after terrorists abroad and to, to prevent terrorists from succeeding at what they're trying to do requires us to be present and forward deployed around the world. And that's obviously something that the president isn't comfortable with. He, he believes that we need to withdraw from these conflict zones, bring our forces home. Um, and these so-called forever wars. But I think as many analysts have pointed out, we were actually doing what we were doing in Syria with a pretty significant economy of force. We were not there with tens of thousands of troops. We were working with partners, as your question suggests, and we were having impact. And what I worry about is if you flash forward six months and we actually implement and execute some of the decisions the president has made with respect to Syria going forward, I'm not sure we'd be able to execute the kind of operation that was executed over the weekend. And that's not that's not a place we want to be. It is Tuesday, the 29th of October of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. You know, really, just a small, scant dash, nary a pinch of smoked hot Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. Oh my, yes it will. Speaking of all the difference in the world, what a difference a uh, decorated uh, military veteran Purple Heart recipient. What a difference that person will make. Of course, you know the GOP will swift boat anyone to get their way, and they have, and they are. <laughs> Yeah, dual loyalties. I love this. Guy was born in Ukraine. While it was part of the Soviet bloc, by the way. Moved here at the age of three. Which just goes to prove he's a double agent. He was working for Ukraine's interests and not the United States. Except for one thing. <laughs> he was working for the United States' interest because Ukraine's interest was and is the United States' interest. And he was furthering the agenda that had been in place and they'd been working on for a very long time. And then comes the three amigos sent by the Scaf Law in chief making deals outside of diplomatic channels and usurping American interests. Now we have to understand what they, they, with a capital T, mean when this guy was not working for Americans' interests. They mean the office of the presidency, as long as it is held by Duma Dani, is America. Duma Dani is the personification of this great nation in physical form, embodied in one body. That's what they believe. 
And that's why Vindman is a traitor in their minds. And that is why you and I, because of the mere fact that we are Democratic voters, are no longer Americans. We just presume that they're being rhetorical. No, it is a firmly held belief we are not allowed to be here. We are not Americans. We don't genuflect to dear leader is the very proof that they need. Now, you need to look at it with those kind of eyes. You can't look at it as if it's just a rhetorical statement. Oh, they're just trying to trigger the libs. No, it is a firmly held belief. It is religious. I think another term that might be used in more crude times is that we are mud people. We are subhuman. That is why whenever we hear Trump going off about, oh, never Trumpers, oh, he wasn't, he's, he's a Democrat, they're, they're just predisposed. He would never use the term predisposed. But I will. Predisposed to hate me. Oh. And that's where we are. CNN and Zucker hiring Sean Duffy. On the 21st of October and by October 29th, he is on CNN as a CNN paid employee, swift boating, really an American hero. Dual loyalties. I got Grant Glenn Greenwald on my timeline whining about, uh, you know, nobody, nobody in the left was upset about uh, Tulsi having dual loyalties. Well, as far as I know, Tulsi wasn't born in Russia. And we weren't talking about dual loyalties in the sense of some kind of, I don't know, blood? Is that what we're talking about? Glenn? Tulsi Gabbard is going to be a third-party candidate just like Vlad wants, whether she's conscious of being a dupe well, or not, which would make her an idiot. It matters not. The results are all the same. Dual loyalties, Glenn. <laughs> Writing from Brazil in Portuguese most of the time. But that's fine. I don't mind that. But this idea that a Ukraine expert has a loyalty to other than the United States, especially when he's there as the point man to push U.S. policy on the Ukraine. <sighs> the reason Nixon was able to resign and not get impeached is because he had help. And what was the one complaint after Watergate that we heard all the time? In fact, we had to get rid of the fairness doctrine to make up for Watergate. And what was that? If only Nixon had Fox News, things would have been very, very different. And now it is. And it's not just Fox we got CNN, too. Zucker. Thanks so much. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, of course, at the top, apparently Trump's yes men did not tell him that details from counterterrorism operations don't need to be revealed. On the rest of the menu, the Trump administration overturned a Civil War-era law the Obama administration used to build bad lending cases against the big banks. Oh yeah, you can lie to your clients again. Don't worry, we know where you're coming from. A Virginia GOP lawmaker says stay-at-home moms caring for a child born with major medical conditions, just like his Democratic opponent, aren't really working day-to-day. -day. Well, that's one way to get the woman vote. Jeez, guy. 
And Oregon's Greg Walden becomes the 17th House Republican who will not run for re-election in 2020. Well, at least he lined his pockets before he had made the announcement. Good thing, too. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where French police arrested a man for firing shots at a mosque in Bayonne in the southwest of France. And serious injuries uh, happened there as well. And Bulgaria demanded Russia to recall its diplomat over spying allegations. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the rightish of the page is our chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly, for doing so. To the leftish of the page from the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. We would be unable to keep this powerhouse of resistance resisting without your generosity after all these many eight years and counting. So 24-7, 365, we've been doing our civic duty with your help and we do again thank you so much for doing so you know it doesn't take much how about just uh the cost of a espresso type coffee drink once a month sent our way and that really helps us well pay that isp bill and all the other sundry fixed costs let alone the variables oh my the variables indeed once again all kidding aside we do thank you for your generosity if you would like to follow Netroots Radio, it is so simple. You can just go on to Twitter and type in at Netroots Radio. And Tom takes care of that, and we thank Tom for doing so. I, of course, take care of at Justice Putnam. Go ahead, follow me there. I dare you. And I also post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime and then get that out there on social media for your linky pleasure. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And really, most importantly, of all great importance, you can get the podcast of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. Okay. Well, let's get right on into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, by the way, and I should warn everybody there is corn in the chowder because that's what makes it chowder, at least on the West Coast. Reuters has now uh, put their reporters' uh, bylines on the bottom of the article, so I have to scroll down there so that I can get proper attribution. It was so much easy when it was at the top, because then it was at the top. And regardless, Pete Schroeder of Reuters brings us this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Trump administration said it would try to entice banks to offer more mortgages to low-income borrowers by reducing reliance on a Civil War-era law the Obama administration used in the wake of the subprime mortgage crisis to build bad lending cases against big banks. <sighs> Entice the banks to lie to their clients. And then they'll start lending money again? What? Okay. I, you would expect a mobster mentality to think like this, wouldn't you? I do. 
<laughs> and I'm not afraid to say so. The U.S. Housing and Urban Development, otherwise affectionately known as HUD, and Justice Department announced they had struck an agreement wherein HUD would handle most enforcement of any violations of the 1863 False Claims Act, which the Justice Department had used to extract billions of dollars from banks. And apparently, that's just not justice served. Hmm. Who would think that? Well, you might have two choices. I, I like, would say they're not necessarily choices that are at opposite um, ends. Mobsters and big bank CEOs. <laughs> What's the diff? I want to know what is the diff. The government is now trying to encourage more banks to offer loans to borrowers eligible for insurance from the Federal Housing Administration otherwise affectionately known as FHA. The FHA provides mortgage insurance on loans created by approved lenders, helping borrowers with less money for down payments or lower credit scores to qualify for home loans. That way, when they get behind on their payments, the bank can just foreclose on their home and sell it to somebody else and do it all over again. It's such a growth industry. In fact, it was such a growth industry before it created this bubble, and it burst, and Obama saved us. Not by himself, of course, but he was at the helm. Do you realize that, as an aside, the farmers have now gotten more bailout money than the auto industry did under Obama, and they wanted to impeach Obama for the socialist practice of saving the auto industry in the United States of America? Remember that? Oh, you don't? I do. After the subprime mortgage crisis, former President Barack Obama's Justice Department frequently won multi-billion dollar settlements from big banks using the False Claims Act to build cases. The government argued that banks improperly certified home mortgages as eligible for FHA insurance leaving the government to pay out insurance when they defaulted. Well, of course. If you're going to starve government and shrink it to the size where you can drown it in a bathtub, you want all that money paid out from government funds, don't you? The specter of those settlements drove away many large lenders from offering FHA-eligible loans, now banks originate less than 14% of FHA-insured mortgages down from 45% in 2010. Interesting. When they were able to lie to the people borrowing money, oh, the business was great. And then when they were taken to court and made to pay a lot of money for lying and, you know, breaking the law. Okay. It's a mobster mentality. It's hard to wrap your head around it if you took American civics, or even if you just have common sense. In his announcement, HUD said the change was meant to address uncertain and unanticipated liability for banks. Do you really think that HUD, under the tutelage, <laughs> the leadership of a Ben Carson, is going to be able to be an investigative arm now and mete out justice? My. Under the new arrangement, HUD will take primary responsibility for policing whether banks are adhering to FHA standards, while the Justice Department will serve more often in a consulting role. In other words, <laughs> criminal indictment? What criminal indictment? We put it over there behind the bar. Dan Desai Martin of Share Blue Media brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. 
Virginia State Senator Bryce Reeves, a Republican representing a district east of Charlottesville who is currently running for re-election, does not consider what stay-at-home parents do all day to be work. Last time I looked, my opponent's not working day to day, Reeves said about Democratic opponent Amy Laufer. Laufer, who lists stay-at-home mom as her occupation on her financial disclosure forms, is raising a daughter and two sons between the ages of 11 and 14. Laufer is a former teacher who decided to stay at home after one of her children was born with a major medical condition. She stays at home and she's lucky enough to have her husband that provides all that stuff, Reeves drawled in my poor southern accent drawl, because I'm patronizing and that's what I do. But I'm working every day and I work hard for the money that we earn. <laughs> yeah, the guy's got to work and be a dick about it, too. Reeves made the statements during an October 21 interview on the Joe Thomas in the Morning radio program after being asked about tax policy. The comments were first unearthed by American Bridge, a liberal research organization. Oh, oppo research might it be. On his campaign website, Reeves says he believes family and faith are the very foundation of every community. Really? Can we parse that down a little bit? You mean family and faith in your eyes? What would that be? I just can't imagine. Actually, I'm only being rhetorical. I have a very good imagination. Laufer shot back in a statement. Women who choose to stay at home with their children are working hard every day to support their family, she said in an email. We are putting food on the table and supporting our children. It is a shame that we have an elected official who does not respect that labor. Reeves has come under fire for making sexist comments in the past. Well, you know, it's like uh, kicking a dog. Pretty soon you're going to be moving up to kicking women. In December of 2012, the state lawmaker voiced his support for SB 44, an anti-abortion piece of legislation that would have required women to undergo invasive transvaginal ultrasound prior to obtaining an abortion because projection doth be thy Republican middle name. The bill, transvaginal ultrasound bill, of which I got to tell you, I think it helps women make a logical, rational decision. Because if you're torturing them, they're going to tell you what you want to know. <sighs> Reeves also came under fire earlier this year for suggesting his Democratic colleague was a negative influence on the state legislator because he was gay. Oh, come on now. <laughs> This guy's living way in the past. According to the Richmond Times-Dispatch, during a town hall meeting in June, Reeves rattled off negatives about State Senator Adam Eben of Alexandria, including saying Eben wanted to radically change Virginia, is really liberal, and he's one of the openly gay uh, senators in our Senate. Reeves, like all 40 ma members of the state Senate and all 100 members of the House delegates, is up for re-election on November 5th. Wow, that's coming up like next week. At the moment, Republicans hold a slight lead in each chamber, but Democrats hope to take control after the election. And you know how that works? You gotta go vote.
Emily Singer of Share Blue Media brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Well, this is another story of when you have a sinking ship of state. The rats are always going to be jumping off because it looks like my representative here in Southern Oregon, Greg Walden, who, by the way, ran the National Republican Congressional Committee for both the 2014 and 2016 cycles. He's getting out while the getting is good. Well, he announced yesterday, Monday, that he will retire rather than seek re-election in 2020, becoming the 17th House Republican to head for the exits. Goodbye. Walden, who serves as the ranking member of the powerful House Energy and Commerce Committee, claimed that his retirement was not because he was worried about his own re-election, oh, really, nor because he felt Republicans could not win back the majority they lost in 2018's blue wave. Really, now? Based on recent polling, strong fundraising, and the backing of my wife and family, I am confident I could earn the support of 2nd District voters for another term. I know, because for some reason, hate sells. I, well, let's be like less hyperbolic here. I don't want to say that that Greg Walden traffics in the kind of hate that we see constantly out of the, well, Republican Party. But he's a Republican. <laughs> and I got to tell you, the people that vote Republican in Southern Oregon have a particular, uh, shall we say, verve. Very, very verbally. And they'll tell you what polite conversation is by the size of the sidearm that they're openly carrying so everyone will know that you better be polite <laughs> or else. Or yeah. So, I, yeah, in his district, he polls really well with Republicans. And I will say that uh, the Republican Party has had pretty much of a lock here in Southern Oregon. Unlike uh, the more liberal enclaves of the rest of the state, except for the more rural areas. And it is funny how that district of Greg Walden's works. Pretty much the second district has uh, the lesser populated areas. And those happen to be very, very, very red because those are people who are into land use. And what that means is they want to use public lands and turn it into their own. And when there's no public lands around, they'll just take yours. <laughs> yeah, just try taking them at court because they'll tell you who is more polite and who isn't. By It's not just the sidearms then. They don't call it the Wild West for nothing. Well, and despite his claim that he believes Republicans have a shot at the majority next year, the fact that he's adding himself to the torrent of Republican officials retiring from Congress could be taken as a sign that Republicans really don't have confidence that control of the House is within reach. You know what, though? I like that. But we need the Senate. If, by some great opportunity, the Democrats control the Congress, the House, the Senate, and the executive. It's not going to be one party rule. Jeez, we're Democrats. But somehow we all come to an agreement to really confer freedom, liberty, and justice for all, due process and equal protection. And we don't even call that a bad thing. Wow, how un American. We better get to our break. And when we get back from said break, we are going to go through weather from around the world, and we are going to finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, Lord of the Flies meets Beasts of No Nation. 
Manos is one of those films where the backgrounds of the various characters remain shrouded. Indeed, we never know where the story is set, only that it's somewhere in the mountains and jungles of South America and follows a group of FARC-like teenage gorillas with names like Wolf, Rambo, and Boom Boom. They carry out the orders of their scary commander who only shows up sporadically. Director Alejandro Landis never resolves how the teens ended up in their situation, although it's hinted that some of them may have been kidnapped. In any case, they're given the job of guarding an American captive known only as Doctora who is being held for ransom. Doctora, played by Julianne Nicholson, speaks little Spanish and is often as lost as the audience. Left to their own devices, the kids are tasked with moving Doctora from a mountain base down to one in the jungle. More indoctrinated into a warped 21st century version of machismo than they are socialized, Monos quickly becomes reminiscent of the classic Lord of the Flies. There's even a pig's head. Monos is less about individual or a specific event than it is about the concepts of humanity, especially developing humanity. When derailed, as in the case of child soldiers, well, the title Manos is the Spanish word for monkeys. Though the concept here may be less than original, this film reminds us of how thin the veneer of civilization can be. Nicholson performs notably as Doctora, especially given the little dialogue she has. The young actors bring off sweet to savage with skills past their years. Cinematographer Jasper Wolf's shooting juxtaposes the gorgeous with the brutal here to create an impactful film which is beautiful, harsh, and wild, and likely to stay with you. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at Take Two Movie Review. Dot com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Rats can do it, mice can do it, honeybees, some people too. And now add green crabs to the list of creatures that can navigate a maze. They're far more sophisticated animals than we give them credit for. Ed Pope, a marine biologist at Swansea University in the UK. Apart from a couple preliminary papers from the early 1900s, he says, including one by the influential psychologist and primatologist Robert Yerkes, there wasn't a lot of evidence whether crabs possess this ability. So Pope and his colleagues went to the shore and brought back a dozen green crabs. They built mazes in the lab and put a crushed muscle at the end as enticement. And then they set the crabs loose and captured video of their movements. Over the next month, the crabs ran, or maybe skittered, through the maze faster and faster to get to the food. But they also started taking fewer and fewer wrong turns. In fact, by week three, we had animals that were taking no wrong turns at all. And that, I think, gave us quite good evidence that they were learning the maze. Then the researchers thoroughly scrubbed the tank to get rid of any telltale muscle aromas. After a few weeks, they put the crabs back into the maze, and even with no muscle waiting at the end of the course, experienced crabs still made it to the end more quickly than crabs who never walked the maze. That ability suggests that the veterans had indeed remembered the route. The details are in the journal Biology Letters. Maze-running crabs are not just a novelty act. The trials demonstrate that wild crabs might be highly competent at returning to a favorite feeding spot or hiding place. And as the world's oceans become more polluted and acidic, the crab finding gives Pope and other scientists a cognitive skill to test to see how crabs and other undersea invertebrates might weather a changing tide. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For an expectant mother, taking care of her developing baby means taking good care of herself. One way she can do this is by ensuring she gets vaccinated. If a woman is or might be pregnant during flu season, it's especially important to get her annual flu shot, preferably before the end of October. In addition, women should be vaccinated against whooping cough during the third trimester of each pregnancy. Failure to get vaccinated places both mother and baby at increased risk for serious complications of these infections, including hospitalization and even death. If you're pregnant or planning to get pregnant, ask your health care provider when you should get your vaccines. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. But mom, don't but mom me. You heard what the doctor said. 
I'm fine. I just got my bell rung. It's not like I blacked out. You've had headaches, dizzy spells, and you're just not yourself. That's not feeling fine. Come on, I can't miss the game. It's still serious, even if you didn't black out. It's better to miss one game than the whole season. All concussions are serious. Know the warning signs and never let your child return to play before a healthcare professional says it's okay. A message from CDC. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondrous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. October 11th, 2019, United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. In the case of the city and state of New York, Connecticut and Vermont versus the Department of Homeland Security, the issue was the new proposed DHS rule on public charge, a rule that said that when a lawful and documented immigrant receives, say, six months of SNAP and Medicaid benefits, which together count as 12 months, within three years, that person could be deported. The new proposed DHS rule was, as the judge found, a drastic deviation from the unambiguous and well-established meaning of the term public charge that has existed in immigration law for over 130 years. It means a person who is likely to become primarily and permanently dependent on the government. The judge ruled, quote, the rule is simply a new agency policy of exclusion in search of a justification. It is repugnant to the American dream of the opportunity for prosperity and success through hard work and upward mobility. Immigrants have always come to this country seeking a better life for themselves and their posterity. With or without help, most succeed. The judge ruled the DHS had no legal authority to rewrite longstanding law. And, quote, plaintiff's motion for issuance of a preliminary injunction is granted. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1929. That bleak day is now known as Black Tuesday, the day of the stock market crash that marked the start of the Great Depression. During the optimistic Roaring Twenties, investments in the stock market soared. Between 1924 and 1929, the Dow Jones Industrial Average quadrupled. By 1929, two of every five dollars borrowed in bank loans were spent on stock investments. As stock investors overextended themselves, they failed to read troubling economic signs. Farm communities were sliding into an economic depression. Consumer credit was reaching unsustainable levels. The first signs, or trouble, began on Black Thursday, October 24th, when the market lost 11% of its value. Then on Monday, it slid another 13%. By Tuesday, the market opened in a melee. In the first 30 minutes, 13 million shares were sold. At the time, stock transactions were recorded on ticker tape. According to Time Magazine, by the end of the panic-filled day, 15,000 miles of ticker tape had been printed. The final totals were devastating. The market had dropped another 12%. Stocks continued to fall over the next few weeks. In all, $25 billion was lost. That equals more than $300 billion in today's money. The events of 1929 signaled the beginning of a global economic depression. The depression was devastating for working people. Before the depression, there were 25,000 banks in the United States. By 1933, 11,000 of them had failed. 
families saw their entire life savings wiped away overnight. Unemployment soared to 25%. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt implemented his New Deal policies to put people back to work. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. If it's Tuesday, all eyes are back on the skiff on Capitol Hill, where depositions continue with Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. He's the top Ukraine expert on the National Security Council and was among the few who actually listened in on that July 25th phone call between Donald Trump and Ukraine's President Zelensky. Vindman will testify that, quote, he believed President Donald Trump undermined U.S. national security when he appealed to Ukraine's president to investigate his political rivals. That quote was taken directly from his opening statement, which was released Monday night. Vindman also plans to say that he reported Trump's July 25th phone call to the NSC's top lawyer after listening in on the conversation from the White House Situation Room alongside other U.S. national security officials. Trump addressed the nation Sunday morning to announce that the U.S. had found and killed ISIS leader al-Baghdadi. Trump had an 800-word scripted announcement to read, but he turned it into a 9,000-word screed filled with his signature brand of lies and braggadocio. Trump described Baghdadi, quote, running into a dead-end tunnel, whimpering and crying and screaming all the way. He went on to say that Baghdadi then detonated a suicide vest, killing himself and his three children, who he apparently used as human shields. Quote, he died like a dog. He died like a coward. The world is now a much safer place, Trump boasted. It was all a lie. There was no live video, in spite of Trump's claims that he watched it, quote, like a movie. The New York Times reports that what Trump saw on his screen was, quote, heat signatures of those moving around, which analysts labeled friend or foe. There was no sound, no real-time imagery in the tunnel. That was just Trump's making crap up. This was confirmed during a press conference at the Department of Defense on Monday. The speaker here is the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley. President Trump described yesterday Baghdadi whimpering and crying before he died. Can you elaborate or confirm those details? I, Secretary was asked the same question yesterday. Um, I know the president had planned to talk down to the unit and, and unit members, uh, but I, I don't know what the source of that was there, but I assume it was talking directly to unit and unit members. So you, don't have, you haven't talked to any unit members who've described that to you? I have not talked to unit members. No, that's correct. I've, I've talked to the commander, CENTCOM, and others, but not down to the unit members, down at that level of fidelity. And to make matters worse, sprinkled in among his lies and exaggerations was legitimate, classified information about the raid. The combination of some of the information that he gave that would have been classified, the one that seems to be gaining the most traction is the information about the dog. Technically, in these kinds of missions, the dog and the breed and everything about that dog is classified. Now, we saw that in the Bin Laden raid, everyone got to know that Cairo was the dog, the Belgian Malinois that was involved in that. But technically, that was a classified detail for the bin Laden raid as well. There were a lot of other details that he gave that the military would call their tactical information. It's the kind of stuff that they just don't like out there. One is the the way that they breach a compound. So he talked about how they blew up a wall because they figured that the uh, front door might have been booby trapped. That's a tactical detail they just don't want out there. He talked about how the helicopters fly very, very fast and very, very low. Again, something they don't really want out there. We know that when they're they're moving through a a combat zone, that might be the way that they fly. But it's not really the kind of detail that the military would want out there, especially from a high-profile and high-platform event like we saw at the White House yesterday. So perhaps you heard that the Democrats are giving in to Republican demands to hold an official vote on Thursday authorizing the impeachment inquiry. That's technically not what the vote is about. It'll be a vote on a resolution on how to proceed to the committee. Pelosi explained, quote, this resolution gives us more opportunity and the committee spells out protection of the rights for the president and his counsel. They should welcome this. Republicans, however, will position the vote as a proxy vote for impeachment. California is burning with more than a dozen blazes that have displaced hundreds of thousands of people and more blazes keep popping up. The Getty fire broke out in L.A. on Monday, spreading like, well, wildfire. 
power outages have also been a serious concern. And on Monday, California's Public Utilities Commission announced it's launching a formal investigation into the practice of investor-owned utilities initiating planned outages. And finally, the six-week strike at General Motors came to a close last week. 50,000 hourly workers at GM went on strike in September to protest, among other things, GM's closure of several U.S. plants. The result was the longest auto industry work stoppage in more than 20 years. A four-year labor deal was approved by UAW and was ratified a few days ago, ending the strike. But now the pressure is on at Ford and Fiat Chrysler to bring their new labor deals to the table. Both companies had trouble getting their contracts approved by union members four years ago. But in a related story, General Motors, Fiat Chrysler, and Toyota have all sided with the Trump administration on the issue of California's right to set its own emission standards. By contrast, some of their biggest competitors, including Honda and Ford, have sided with California to follow their rules. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener-supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com. Please click on that Donate button. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently, oh no, burr, another 29 degrees Fahrenheit, what the heck? And uh, we are expected to be considerably cooler than yesterday. Well, not considerably. A few degrees less than what we were yesterday. We are expected to only have a high of about 57 to 60, maybe not even 60. So winds are out of the south. will be out of the east at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And they're out of the northeast, currently light and variable. And will remain out of the east uh, overnight. And we should have sunny conditions today, clear skies, mainly sunny tomorrow, topping out with a high in the low 60s overnight lows. Well, looks like the mid 30s or chillier in those protected valleys. How protected are they? Let's see. Pollen is rated at none. Air quality index is in the good range at 28 parts per million. Not so good if you're having uh breathing problems that elderly people may have. That daytime UV index is moderate at three and barometric pressure locally is holding steady currently at 30.22 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 64% drying out a tad. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 53 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 53 and partly cloudy. Rome is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. Kiev is 48 and fair. Kabul is 61 degrees and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 72 and fair, with a slight chance of heads being knocked by the military and the law enforcement security officers because they don't like protests anymore, especially for democracy. Tokyo is 56 and fair. Sydney, Australia is 65 and fair. San Francisco, California is 48 and fair with another wind advisory, and they are having bad fires Stay clear of those. And New York, New York is 57 degrees Fahrenheit and foggy with a fog alert. So take care in the Big Apple. That is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. 
These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. De Klerk, Jean Michel Bellot, and Maya Nakaleva of Reuters bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. French police have arrested a man suspected of firing shots at a mosque in Bayonne in the southwest of France yesterday, Monday. Two people, aged 74 and 78, were seriously injured in the shooting as they tried to prevent the attacker from setting fire to the mosque. The shooter also set a car on fire while fleeing the area. The suspected assailant was arrested by national police. My thoughts are with the victims and their family, Interior Minister Christophe Castaner said on his Twitter account. A police source said that the 84-year-old suspect had far-right connections, and a separate source familiar with the situation said the man had been a candidate for Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party in 2015, and the National Rally Party in Marine Le Pen's name uh, condemned the attack and said that it goes against their values of our movement. And the police source said a handgun was found in the suspect's car. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est doux Svetelia Solova and Angel Krasimirov of Reuters bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Russian diplomat who Bulgarian prosecutors suspect was involved in espionage has left Bulgaria, the Bulgarian Foreign Ministry said. The ministry had asked for his recall in a meeting with the Russian ambassador last Friday. The exact circumstances of the diplomat's departure were not clear. We can only guess what it was, though. A request was made to the Russian institutions to recall their official by the end of Monday, according to Foreign Ministry information. The person in question has already left Bulgaria, the statement said. The Russian Foreign Ministry and its embassy in Sofia had no immediate comment. In a separate statement yesterday, Monday, prosecutors said an investigation launched after a tip from the security services established that a first secretary at the Russian embassy had been involved in intelligence activities for over a year. I'm shocked. Prosecutors said the diplomat has since has since last September held conspiratorial meetings with Bulgarians, including with a senior official with a clearance for classified information from Bulgaria, the EU, and NATO. Interesting. The prosecutor said they had closed the investigation despite reasonable grounds for espionage charges because the suspect had diplomatic immunity. Bulgaria, a loyal ally of Moscow in Soviet times, is now a member of NATO and the EU, but has close cultural and historic ties to Russia, which remains its biggest energy supplier. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. 
So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver